podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Katie Starr, and I am with the Stanley Premium Western Forage marketing team. Stanley Premium Western Forage is located in southern Idaho with ideal growing conditions to raise some of the best quality forage in the country. We're so thankful to have you here today. We're looking forward to sharing some important nutritional information. Your priority is to meet your animals' nutritional needs and provide them comfort. Our priority is to support you with that in any way we can. We're very excited to offer this educational webinar titled Beet Pulp. What is it and why do horses need it? So what have you heard about beet pulp? This superfiber is underutilized when it comes to feeding horses and brings along many questions with it. What is it? How do you feed it? And so on. If you happen to be new to joining our webinars, we'll take just a minute to go over a few items so you are comfortable with viewing and participating in our webinar. As a heads up, we will have just a couple of poll questions throughout the webinar that we will pause the presentation for you to answer. We will also be giving away some free product coupons at the end of the webinar, so you'll want to stay with us till the end. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Clicking on the red box with a white arrow allows you to open and close the control panel anytime you'd like during the presentation. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will also have an opportunity to submit questions via text to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And just depending on how many questions that come in, we may not be able to address all of them within our time frame, but we will certainly use them for future nutritional pieces and we'll definitely connect with you one-on-one -on -one if you reach out to us. We have also attached a couple of nutritional papers associated with today's webinar that you can download from the control panel under handouts. And for those that are viewing this as a recording, go to stanleyforage.com under nutrition and nutritional resources to find the handouts titled Beet Pulp, What Do I Need to Know? And research shows soaking beet pulp reduces sugar content. These are both great take-home pieces for this webinar. And that's all I have from an introductory standpoint. So please welcome Dr. Tanya Cubitt with Performance Horse Nutrition, who serves as one of our Stanley Premium Western Forage equine nutritionists. She has a PhD in equine nutrition and reproduction. And with that, I will go ahead and let Dr. Cubitt share just a little bit more about herself before she begins the presentation. Thank you, Katie, and thank you everybody for joining in. Um, this is an interesting topic, but as Katie said, a little bit about myself. Uh, originally from Australia, moved here in 2001, did a master's and PhD at Virginia Tech, and then started working with performance horse nutrition. As Katie said, we are the independent consultants that work with Stanley with Premium Western Forage. So without further ado, let's get right into this topic because I know we'll probably have a lot of questions at the end, so we purposely want to get rolling. Um, <clears throat> as Katie mentioned, we're going to talk about what it is how do you feed it? Perhaps how do you balance it if you're adding it to the diet and it's not the sole source of nutrition in the diet? Uh, what's beneficial in it for horses? And how is it beneficial or how does it affect those horses that are carbohydrate sensitive, so sensitive to sugars and starches? Obviously, if there is anything that we do not address throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask in the chat at the end or email in your questions. So let's start at the beginning. And I've got beet pulp history here, but we really should go back to sugar beets, the plant that beet pulp comes from. Beet pulp is a byproduct of the sugar industry, and it comes from these sugar beets, uh, which is actually a relative 
to, and it's part of the same group as our common beets that in America aren't that commonly eaten, but in Australia we eat a lot of beets. We call it beetroot, have it on hamburgers, all kinds of things. Um, its closest wild relative would be the sea beet. Um, it was most successfully first started growing in the United States around 1870. It was cultivated before then, but was not successfully grown until the 1870s. Interestingly, now I know this is about five years old, this data, but it's interesting the countries in the world that grow the most beet pulp or the most sugar beets, I should say, Russia, France, United States, Germany, and Turkey. Um, when you think about sugar beets are grown in very temperate climates versus sugar cane is grown in our tropical climates. Um, a little more facts about the actual sugar beet plant. If you look at it in the ground, it actually looks like a big radish. Sugar beet has this conical white fleshy taproot and the, the leaves actually fan out like a flat crown. Sugar is formed by photosynthesis like in other plants um, and photosynthesis, the sun is shining on those leaves. We've got photosynthesis occurring, but unlike in grasses or legumes, that sugar is not stored in the leaves primarily, but it's stored in the root. The root contains about 75% water, about 20% sugar, and about 5% pulp. And it's that pulp that we are eventually going to feed our horse after all of the water and sugar has been extracted. The average weight of a sugar beet ranges between two and five pounds, so they're very big. There's actually no difference in the sugar that comes from beets or comes from cane. The main difference is just the climates in which these grow. So in Australia, it's a very tropical climate. We don't grow sugar beets, we grow sugar cane. But in your temperate climates, we grow beets for human sugar consumption. I thought this picture on the bottom left right hand corner was quite interesting so that you can see this cross section of how deep those roots go down um, and how they may affect the soil. So we're also interested in how these plants may affect the soil and are they taking all of the nutrients or are they doing anything for the soil that they're grown in. Unlike alfalfa, which we talked about in our previous webinar, alfalfa will put nitrogen back into the soil. Sugar beets won't put nitrogen into the soil, but you can see how large that taproot is, that beet, and it keeps that soil from getting really hard and compacted. So it really keeps the soil quality quite high for growing subsequent crops. So there are benefits to growing these really um, large taprooted plants. Beets are planted in late March, early April, so late spring, and harvested in late September to October. Interestingly, the beet tops can also be used for animal forage. Uh, we don't use them in equine feeds, but you'll, if you ever see a sugar beet being harvested, it'll come in, the harvester will come in with teeth, and knives will slice the top of those leaves off, and then finger-like projections come behind that and actually dig up the, the, the sugar beet and that goes into the truck, into the tractor and into the truck. But those leaves can be collected later and used for start silage in other livestock species. So that's good to know that all of the plant can be used. The beet pulp is what is left after the sugar in the water has been extracted from that sugar beet. So leading us down that path to understanding beet pulp is actually relatively low in sugars. No starches because sugar is the storage unit in these plants. Whoops. <clears throat> I'll make sure we don't have this. Now I'm going to play a little movie here, just a quick part of the movie, so that you can get a feel from how those sugar beets come from the farm and are uh, brought into the processing facilities. And interestingly enough, these, um, these processing facilities are very close to the farms. These processing facilities are all surrounding these farms because these beets don't actually transport very well. So you can see that these beets are stored in large piles 
um, in the field and they dry out and then trucks transport them to these processing facilities which are very close to the, the fields that they're grown in. They go into these large hoppers that are turning and what we're doing in here is we're washing those beets and we're also sifting out any extra dirt or stones because when those forks are lifting up those beets, they're not detecting stones. So we don't want, we want to make sure that there's no stones going into this processing facility that could get into the pulp or ruin those, um, those machines. So we've washed it, we're sifting it out. Now we're going into the main factory where these beets are going to be processed further. Now this machine is making what we call cossettes. It's slicing those beets very finely. And it'll show you an image here. Beet before being sliced, beet afterwards. Almost looks like what you would see getting hash browns. Now we're going to go into washing. Now we're leaching out the sugars out of that very finely sliced beet. It's going to go into these big tanks full of very hot water. And it's going to get sifted around, sifted around, and mixed. And this pulp now is going to sift to the top and we'll have all of that sugary water, which we call raw juice, is sifting to the bottom. So from there, that sugar is, that raw juice is extracted away from that pulp. So those, that pulp has floated to the top and we take that off. That raw juice goes on further to be processed more extensively um, <clears throat> the water is evaporated out of it and we're left with a sugary substance that is further spun down so that white sugar separates away from a, a molasses-like structure. Now that molasses substance, which is, which is not the same as cane molasses, it has much lower sugar content because we've separated out the majority of the sugar. It's actually much higher in protein and other nutrients. And we call this concentrated separator byproduct or CSB. And this you'll notice on the bag, this is listed in the ingredients. It's not anything foreign that's in that beet pulp. It was, <clears throat> it's part of that beet pulp that's not fully extracted out. But this is, as it notes here, higher in crude protein, but much lower in sugar content than cane molasses. And this is what's left in that beet pulp um, that still has a small amount of sugar. So we'll move on. Now, beet pulp itself, with that combined CSB, is still very low, uh, relatively low in sugars. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can notice from these handfuls, we'll talk about the different forms that it can come in too. These values here, the 7.5% protein, 0.85% calcium, 0.1% phosphorus, and around 11% non-structural carbohydrates are average stand lead values. These really sit right in mid-range of average beet pulp values for these numbers. But these numbers being represented here is what you're going to be seeing in a Stanley, either shred or beet pulp pellet. <clears throat> now let's go on to our very first poll question. Katie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. Our first polling question is, what feed or forage product is highest in energy? And the options are beet pulp, oats, or alfalfa. Please go ahead and select the appropriate response and click submit. Don't worry if you're a little bit unsure of the answer, just provide your best guess. Your specific answer won't be seen by any of the other attendees, but we'll go ahead and view the total responses together once the poll is closed. Okay, it looks like about 75% of you have responded. Please go ahead and respond and, and submit your responses now. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the poll. And I want to share with you what everybody responded. It looks like we had about 23 responded for beet pulp, 33 per responded for oats, and 44% responded for alfalfa. 
So Dr. Cubitt, I will go ahead and hand it back over to you to address the responses. Excellent, and thank you everybody for participating. Now, as far as energy content, which was the poll question correct, Katie, um, oats has the highest energy content and it also has the highest sugar and starch content. Followed in energy content by beet pulp, correct, beet pulp is a little higher than alfalfa, but not as high as oats. And alfalfa has the lower, <clears throat> lowest of those three when it comes to energy content. <clears throat> alfalfa and beet pulp are very similar in their sugar content, their NS non-structural carbohydrate content. Beet pulp getting its non-structural carbohydrates from sugars and alfalfa from starches. We will move on. So some of the other nutritional benefits to beet pulp. Well, it's low cost. Um, it comes, it, it, it's literally a, a very efficient byproduct of the sugar industry. So humans consume a lot of sugar, probably way too much sugar. There is sugar in everything that we consume. And when we're processing these beets, we realize and trying to extract all that sugar, what are we going to do with this, this pulp? And we, we've done so much research on it, showing that it's an, actually an excellent fiber source. It's very highly digestible. Some re researchers even consider it a prebiotic because it really feeds those hindgut bacteria and keeps them healthy. Um, as I've mentioned, very highly digestible, higher energy than oats, slightly low, higher energy than alfalfa, sorry, slightly lower than oats, low in potassium. So if you've got any of these horses that are sensitive to potassium, like horses with HYPP, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, which we will see in our court, some of our quarter horses um, that need a low potassium diet, it's ideal there. Ideal for older horses that have poor teeth because you can soak it and it's very digestible. In the fall, when we're looking to add more fiber to the diet, but also add more moisture and water to the diet because the seasons are changing, ideal there too. And ideal because you can get it in two different forms. Let's look at some of those myths and then we'll touch on how to feed it. <clears throat> now. These aren't the these are these are probably the most common myths that I get asked about. That's not necessarily, you know, the most common myth that you know about. But these are some different myths that I wanted to address here today. So the myth is in green and the fact is in yellow. Sugar beets are treated with a chemical defoliant to kill the top leaves. Absolutely not. I will encourage you all to Google YouTube harvesting beet pulps. You will see that there are knives that go in and slice the leaves off the top and then forks that dig the beets out of the ground. There is absolutely no use of chemicals to kill the leaves on the top of the beet pulps. Absolutely not true. Beet pulp also contains the leaves and can cause oxalate poisoning. Oxalates will bind up calcium in the bones and cause all kinds of problems in horses with calcium and phosphorus dynamics. The leaves are not part of the beet pulp. The leaves are sliced off, the tops are sliced off, left in the field, and the beets, you saw the beets going into the hoppers, being washed, being spun around to get all the dirt and rocks out. There is no leaves in the beet pulp that we feed our horses. Um, the pulp, the actual pulp that we feed our horses is very, very low in oxalate. So we do not have to be concerned with that. Production of beet pulp can, it involves many harsh chemicals. And this is a broad statement that some people make. There are no chemicals used in the production of beet pulp, which is what remains after hot water soaks over those tiny little French fry parts of, of sugar beet, um, the cossettes. There is no chemicals used to get beet pulp. We slice it up, we wash it with hot water, suck all as much um, sugar out as we possibly can, we evaporate the water, we dry that beet pulp, and that's what you get. There is no chemical used. 
Bee pulp is high in insoluble fiber and it's poorly digestible. This is the complete opposite. It's actually very low in non-digestible or insoluble fiber, much lower than grass haze. Um, it's very easily digested by the bacteria in the hindgut that ferment that fiber. It feeds those bacteria. As I've mentioned, some people call it a prebiotic because it's really feeding those bacteria. Beet pulp is high in sugar. As we've discussed, the sugar is extracted so that we can eat it and everything we eat. Beet pulp is relatively low in sugars, around 11%. If you soak it, you can soak even more sugars out of it. Will it swell in my horse's stomach and cause it to burst? Another myth that I hear often. And I think this one stems from the fact of when you put water in with your beet pulp, it swells rapidly. But the amount of liquid in the equine mouth and stomach is not sufficient to expand the beet pulp to a point that it will explode the horse's stomach. So that is just not physically possible. Let's look at beet pulp in the diet. And I think we've got another poll question. Katie? Thank you. So our second polling question is, do you feed your horse beet pulp? The options are all year long, only during the winter, no, but I'm interested to learn how to incorporate, no, I do not, or other. So please go ahead and select the appropriate response and click Submit. Okay, it looks like we've had about 75% respond. If you haven't yet had a chance, please go ahead and send in your response. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. And let's take a look at what we have. So it looks like 50% of our attendees feed uh, bee pulp all year long, 11% only during the winter, 31% say no, but I'm interested in learning how to incorporate. So very good that you're on the webinar today. 3% say no, I do not, and 4% say other. So I will go ahead and turn it back over to Dr. Cubitt. Thank you very much, Katie, and we will move on. So a common question is, well, if I'm interested in feeding it, how do I feed it, or I've been feeding it, am I doing it right? It's typically soaked. Why? Because it increases the palatability, it decreases rate of intake, and it hydrates the GI tract. Anytime I can decrease rate of intake, I'm simulating how a horse would eat in the wild. They are slowly nibbling away at grass constantly all day long. So in a stall or a more domesticated setting, that's what I'm trying to simulate. I want everything they eat to be slowly consumed over the whole day. And especially this time of year where we're shifting out of that warmer summer weather where there's moisture in the grass and they're drinking a lot more water due to the temperatures and we're going to cooler weather where they've backed off their water intake and they're eating a lot more dry forage or hay. We've got this overall decrease in moisture content in the GI tract, which oftentimes can lead to impaction colic. So if you don't add beet pulp year round and you kind of just do it seasonally, now is a good time of year to do it and soak it because it's really helping to hydrate that GI tract and avoid impaction colics. How do we feed it? Well, I usually recommend at least a two to one water to beet pulp ratio. So if you've got two, one cup of beet pulp, put two cups of water. Another way of doing it is if you put your beet pulp in the bucket, however much you're feeding, make sure when you cut, when you're putting water in, that it is fully submerged and there's about a half an inch of water on top of that beet pulp. We want to make sure it's fully submerged though. Um, how long are you going to soak it for? 15 minutes is really the bare, bare minimum. We prefer um, 30 minutes to an hour in most scenarios, but I've got this wider range here. In the cooler weather, you can soak it a little longer, up to two hours. Um, obviously, be careful if it's freezing that your water doesn't freeze and make an ice block of beet pulp. And if you're in a hot climate, 
um, that you're not soaking it too long so that it may ferment and go a little rancid. Now, I mentioned that you can soak more sugars out of it. If you're just adding water to your beet pulp, like in this bucket, and we're soaking it, and we're going to feed that expanded soaked beet pulp, then obviously that hasn't leached any sugars because the water containing those leached sugars is still in the product. If you truly want to try and leach some more sugars out of the beet pulp, put a, a mesh bucket on the inside, put your beet pulp in that, and put maybe like five to one, put a lot more water, and then when you're done soaking it, actually drain that water out, pull that strainer out with your wet foot beet pulp in it. When it comes to which form is going to absorb water faster, your shreds will absorb water faster because they've got much more surface area. I wanted to show you a diet here of how we can use beet pulp as an ideal calorie source. Say we've got an older horse and we want to add some more calories, but we don't necessarily want to add any more grain in the diet. Um, how can we use beet pulp for calories? Well, we've got a, a thousand pound horse doing light exercise. We're feeding about 15 pounds of our um, nice Timothy hay. We're feeding him a pound of a ration balancer pellet that's really not offering a lot of calories. It's just giving him his multivitamins. And if we add two pounds of beet pulp on top of that, let me kind of assess you to this graph here. Energy, protein, calcium, phosphorus, copper, zinc, selenium, manganese, iodine, lysine, vitamin A and vitamin E along the bottom. And what we want is to see all these bars touch that red line, which would mean 100% of that nutrients requirement had been met. So you can see digestible energy, 100, maybe 102% of that has been met. So this is a nice diet for a horse doing light exercise, hay, some beet pulp for some extra calories, and a ration balancer pellet. We're giving the horse the calories in the form that it is designed to digest in the form of fiber. I will always try and improve the quality of fiber before adding large quantities more of grain. So to summarize, who, who needs it or who, who can really benefit from it the most? Horses that need to gain some weight, use it in combination with fat um, or other calor high calorie sources, but horses needing to gain weight. Horses with poor teeth because you can really mad wet it, make a slurry out of it, and it's very easy for them to digest. Horses that suffer from the uh, genetic disorder HYPP, so some of those quarter horses, because it's very low in potassium. Horses that have ulcers. So if we want to take away some of the sugars and starches that are coming from grain and replace that with beet pulp, that will help with our gastric and colonic ulcers. Also horses that may be post-colic surgery that can't yet eat that long stem forage, but we're slowly trying to incorporate more fiber into the diet that's going to be highly digestible. So with that, let's open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Kiewit, for some great insight into what beet pulp is and how it benefits horses. Um, really quick before we get to the questions, I just wanna remind everyone to go ahead and download the nutritional papers under handouts before we end the webinar. You can find them on our website as well. And we will be drawing our winner for free product coupons following the Q&A session, so please stick around for that. So let's go ahead and get started on a few questions that were submitted during today's presentation. Again, feel free to continue to submit questions as we go through the Q&A session in the questions pane of your attendee control panel. And Dr. Cubit, our first question is from Scott, and the question is, myth or fact, feeding beet pulp causes high prevalence of equine choke? <laughs> really, this is a great question, and, and it's, it's probably a, a very common question. I'm glad you brought it up. So, when horses choke, it actually has nothing to do with what they're eating and everything to do with how they're eating it. I find a lot more horses that do not have access to pasture choke. Um, 
and so that leads me to you know I have I've had horses choke on hay before because they're eating it too quickly they can choke on beet pulp they can choke on sweet feed they can choke on pellets some things that I do I wet everything not because I'm worried about the beet pulp swelling or the pellets swelling in the horse's throat that is not what I'm concerned about what I'm concerned about is them getting too large a mouthfuls because I know we think our horses are smart but when we meal feed them they don't know when you're coming back I know we do it twice a day and we do it at the same time but they're not sure that you're going to come back and especially if there are other horses around in the stalls beside them they're going to eat their food really quickly to make sure that they get it um, and especially when you put that bucket at chest height which most of us do most of us don't feed off the ground and the studies have shown, research has shown, let's say we put two pounds of grain on the ground. That horse will chew about a thousand times. Put that same two pounds of grain at chest height and the horse will chew 350 to 500 times. So we're significantly decreasing the amount of saliva production just by the placement of the feed. What does saliva do? Helps lubricate the throat so that you can swallow the food. So you get where I'm getting he going here. It's not the beet pulp or anything that you feed. It's how the horses are eating it and the management of how they're eating it. So I always soak beet pulp if I'm, especially if I'm feeding about two pounds or more of dry beet pulp. I'm definitely going to soak that because I want to slow down rate of intake. I am not concerned about it swelling in their throat. I want to slow down rate of intake so they're not taking huge, large mouthfuls. I also always feed horses on the ground. And if you say, well, my horse tips it over, put it in a big muck tub and strap it to the wall. There is a lot of ways that you can feed horses on the ground. So sorry, that was a very long answer to a short question, but I hope that's helped. That was excellent, Dr. Hewitt. Thank you. Um, let's see our next question. Paula asks, um, it's a little bit of a short question, but basically calcium and phosphorus diet balancing. Absolutely. And, and anybody who was taking notice on that slide will notice that beet pulp is very high in calcium and not very high in phosphorus. Um, and that's actually the way that we would prefer to have a, a ratio. If we're going to be one way or another, you definitely want to have more calcium than phosphorus. I would not be recommending you feed this if we had, you know, 0.8% cal phosphorus and 0.1% calcium. So in, in growing horses, you can go as high as five to one calcium to phosphorus. In a mature horse, you can go as high as six to one in your ratio of calcium to phosphorus. If you're feeding large quantities of beet pulp though, we would also, I would always recommend, so if you're feeding more than three pounds of beet pulp, I'm going to recommend that you speak with your veterinarian or your nutritionist to make sure that the diet is not unbalanced. Um, maybe adding in some wheat bran or maybe looking at the, the, the vitamin and mineral that you're supplementing your horse. But that's a good question because we do have a lot more calcium than phosphorus. But as I said, you can go six to one ratio with mature horses and five to one in young growing horses. Excellent. So Debbie asks, I have a seized horse body scored a one by our vet. How much beet pulp do I start with? How much is for maintenance? Okay, so um, I'm assuming this is a rescue horse. He's very thin is what you've said. The, the main concern before you start feeding this horse is do you know his backstory? Has he, he's obviously been starved, but when was the last time he ate? Because beet pulp may not be the best thing to start with. We're very, always with a horse like this, there is something I'm concerned with called refeeding syndrome. And with a thin horse like this, the first thing you wanna do is just feed it anything it'll eat. But actually the first place that you would start would be with alfalfa, not beet pulp. We would start feeding that horse small amounts of, beet, of alfalfa frequently throughout the day. 
Alfalfa has the right um, nutrient profile because what will happen with refeeding syndrome, and you won't notice this, it won't kick in till about 24, 48 hours after you start feeding the horse, is you can really unbalance electrolytes and you can cause that horse to have a heart attack. So I would actually re recommend that um, for the first few days, you feed small meals of alfalfa pellets soaked as well um, frequently throughout the day. Then when you want to start incorporating other fiber sources and calories, start adding beet pulp, wet it, cup, two cups at a time, but also you're probably going to want to add in some vegetable oil as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. And Carrie asks, under what circumstances would you not utilize beet pulp in a horse's diet? I wouldn't use beet pulp if the horse is fat and we're trying to restrict calories. That's really the, the main time that I wouldn't use beet pulp. Perfect. And Norman would like to know, we have some horses prone to laminitis. Would beet pulp be a good supplement? Again, this comes back to are those horses fat? If they're fat and you're trying to restrict calories, then no, I wouldn't. Um, I, I would make sure that you're feeding a low carbohydrate hay and it's in front of them, you know, lower in nutritional value. They're just chewing on it all day and probably a ration balance or pellet. Um, if these horses do need some calories, then absolutely. And if the horse is actively foundering, then you would soak this feed pulp. Leach out some more of those sugars and it would be a very good um, calorie source, but only if the horse needs weight gain. Great. And Debbie would like to know, I have a rescued horse that has bad diarrhea. Will beet pulp help him? Beet pulp can be beneficial with these cases of chronic diarrhea because it will absorb more moisture and feed those bacteria. Perfect. And Kelly has a question. I have a 34-year-old uh, Arabian that has bad back teeth and is eating alfalfa pellets because of the need to keep up his weight. Can I trade that out for beet pulp shreds? I would probably be more inc inclined to go with beet pulp pellets because if he's got the bad back teeth, when you use the beet pulp pellets and you wet those, they're already ground up, so it'll be a lot easier for him to almost slurp that up. So instead of the shreds, I'd be more inclined to go with beet pulp pellets that you've soaked and made a mash out of. But yes, that would be a little more ideal than alfalfa because we're going to get more calories for his weight gain. Okay, and Mary Ann would like to know, what about feed with beet pulp in it? What percent would be good for average horses if added to feed already? Um, it, it's in a lot of our high fat, high fiber performance feeds. And in those feeds, we've usually got a higher fat content. So I don't um, say that you, you don't have to absolutely soak those feeds, just as a side note. Um, and if, if, there's, or if you're already feeding a high beet pulp, high fat um, kind of feed, then my recommendations are still the same. If you don't have a great quality hay and you want to in, get even more calories, then up to about, I, I really max out at feeding two pounds of beet pulp a day. I don't like to feed more than that. That's quite a lot of beet pulp when you're going to soak it and wet it, usually about a pound a day dry and then you'll wet that. Great. And Catherine would like to know, do we have to slowly add beet pulp mash to our horse's diet? Um, if you're transitioning them to beet pulp and they've not been on beet pulp before, then absolutely, like any other feeding change, make it gradually. Perfect. And Jenny would like to know, would you prefer to see a horse with GI issues or ulcers on beet pulp or alfalfa? alfalfa because it's higher in calcium but saying that I would use a combination okay good and let's see Pat would like to know what is the consequence of soaking longer than two hours from morning to evening feeding um, it, it's primarily in those hotter climates that it may ferment and go and spoil 
Perfect. And let's see. Elaine would like to know, is there any feed that Beet Pulp does not complement? Mm, no. Good. So it works for everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, other feeds, if you're telling, if you're asking horse that it doesn't complement, we go back to the fat horse. Right. Perfect. And Beth would like to know, what is the best way to utilize beet pulp for senior horses who are having difficulty chewing hay? How much, how often can it replace other forage? So in a research setting, we have fed uh, an 1100 pound horse has been fed um, 12 pounds of beet pulp in a day. I don't, as I mentioned, I don't recommend that. For the older horse, I'm going to recommend he's on a senior feed um, that you can wet. So that's going to give him his vitamins and minerals. And then adding a couple of pounds of um, beet pulp if you want to. Um, now, the senior feeds, if you're feeding them correctly, have a very high feeding rate. So you're going to get a lot of beet pulp and other fiber sources there. Um, but having just hanging a bucket of wet beet pulp would be ideal as well, probably one to two pounds. Okay. And Cindy would like to know, when trying to add weight, which is better, beet pulp or alfalfa? Beet pulp is a higher calorie content, so beet pulp is better than alfalfa for weight gain. Perfect. And Chantel would like to know, my horse will not eat soaked beet pulp. How can I add it to his feed? I would say if you're feeding large quantities, then continue to soak it, but go to the grocery store and buy some banana or as you would say banana flavored powdered pudding and sprinkle it on the beet pulp um, horses love banana flavoring the top three flavors that horses select are banana fenugreek and anise anise tastes like licorice fenugreek tastes like maple syrup and obviously we know what bananas taste like um, sprinkle it on that wet beet pulp and he'll eat it and let's see, Scott would like to know, if I want to start the beet pulp pellet soaking 12 hours before feeding, for example, prepping at breakfast for dinner, will I be able to slow down fermentation and or mold if I add some apple cider vinegar to the soaking water? That doesn't sound very scientific to me. I, I wouldn't do that with my horse, put it that way. And Joanne, would you feed either the pellets or the, sh the shreds dry? Um, if you're feeding a very small amount, then it would be fine. But I'm always a proponent of soaking everything just because I want to get more moisture into the horse's gut. Okay. And Leslie would like to know, can donkeys eat beet pulp and at what percent of the diet? So donkeys are really easy keepers. So we always say that the energy requirement or the, the nutrient requirements for donkeys are 75% that of their horse counterparts. So um, you can feed it to donkeys, but most donkeys are overweight and don't need it. But if you've got a donkey that you're trying to maintain weight on, again, I, I don't like to feed any a max of two pounds of, of dry beet pulp that you'll soak. So I really max out at one to two pounds. Okay. And Kay would like to know, if you combine alfalfa and beet pulp in a wet mash, is there a preferred ratio of alfalfa to beet pulp? No. Okay. And let's see. Jamie would like to know, I feed my horse eight ounces of oats in the morning and night with a vitamin and mineral supplement. He's an easy keeper. What is the recommended feeding rate for beet pulp? I would switch that over to eight ounces of beet pulp so, and, and then soak it. Um, if he's an easy keeper, that's going to be much better than the eight ounces of oats. He's going to feel like he's getting more, um, but it's much lower in sugars and starches. And, and let's see. JS asked, is there a maximum daily amount of beet pulp per day or per feeding? 
per feeding, I really don't like, well, per day, I don't like to feed more than maxing out at two to three pounds. Um, and I would obviously prefer to split that up over three yeah, meals. Absolutely. Okay. And Michelle would like to know, let's see, this will be our last question. What is the best phosphorus additive to balance? Oats are high in phosphorus, as is wheat bran. Okay, perfect. So again, thank you, Dr. Cubit, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. We got a lot of great questions in today. We really appreciate your time and interest in wanting to learn more about nutrition for your animals. Before we wrap up, we'll go ahead and announce our winner of free product coupons now. So the winner for today is Jan, I believe it's Shakespeare. So congratulations. We will email you to get your mailing information so we can send out your coupons. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you have any other questions that weren't answered during today's presentation, please feel free to contact Stanley's customer relations team. The phone number and email are available on this final slide. You can also find some of our past webinars, more nutritional white papers, and other great information and tools on our website at stanleyforage.com. And we also just recently launched our community blog, which is very exciting. We're having a lot of fun with it so far. So go ahead and check out our giveaway that just posted today. So go visit that to see what other kind of fun freebies you and your horse can win. And when you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and it would be very appreciated if you would complete that for us. Your feedback will really help us create better webinars for you and help us identify some great topics for future webinars that we will host next year. You will also receive a follow-up email within about 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar if you'd like to go back and reference it. The recording should be available for a week following today's webinar, and then it will be available on our website under Nutritional Resources. So on behalf of Stanley Premium Western Forage and Dr. Cubit, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar, and we hope you have a great rest of your week.